Let's see, it has been a busy day uh, today, so I apologize I wasn't here for uh, parts of it. Uh, not much um, new uh, to report beyond, I think, what I uh, understand Wayne and Mark and um, Pat briefed the um, audience to today. But uh, of course, the crew is safe. The crew has returned to Baikonur. Uh, they are under just standard observation at a hospital. They've been reunited with their families, and uh, we'll be getting them back to uh, Star City uh, very shortly. So uh, the crew is safe. Uh, the investigations, uh, the investigation will uh, be underway very soon. There's already been uh, initial formulation uh, of the Russian Commission, and we've also had uh, some discussions on the NASA side as well. Uh, for us, it's typical to also stand up a, a NASA investigation too. So, so that uh, will be those preliminary discussions have already occurred as well. Let's see. With that, uh, let me introduce the um, CRS panel members. I'll do it alphabetically by uh, company name. So, first, I'd like to introduce Mr. Bob Richards from uh, Northrop Grumman. He is the Vice President of Human Spaceflight Systems. So, Bob, welcome. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Come on over. Let's see. From Sierra Nevada Corporation, Steve Lindsay, Vice President, Space Exploration Systems. And uh, Benji Reed, uh, SpaceX Director of Commercial Crew, Mission Management, and uh, distinguished alum of Commercial Cargo as well um, prior to uh, joining the crew team. So Thank you, man. thanks for joining today. Let's see. Um, I think I'll have a seat as well. I have just a few opening comments and a brief video for you. Let's see, I am the uh, manager of the uh, Transportation Integration Office, and I manage uh, the fleet of spacecraft uh, that uh, come to the space station, including our two CRS, current CRS-2 vendors, our, current, our two current CRS vendors plus our new one for CRS-2. So that is, is of course, the uh, Northrop Grumman Cygnus and the uh, SpaceX Dragon. We also help integration with the progress of Soyuz, so we will be uh, also very involved with the uh, Soyuz investigation to come. Uh, as well as uh, we work very closely with our JAXA colleagues for the HTV. We're very excited in the coming months to uh, welcome two more, com two more commercial craft uh, to the space station, being the commercial crew vehicles, uh, Boeing CST-100, of course, and the SpaceX Crew Dragon. Uh, not long after that, uh, we'll have on CRS-2, uh, Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser, and then a few years down the line, the JAXA HTV-X. So really a very exciting time uh, to be working uh, with all the, all the visiting vehicles. With that, um, I wanted to go to the video. Very good, and there, of course, is the International Space Station. Um, let's see. What I wanted to show you is some of the latest uh, accomplishments for the CRS vehicles. Uh, here we've got, uh, back in May of 2018, this is the last orbital ATK mission. This one was dedicated to J.R. Thompson. There in the middle of the screen, you can see the Cygnus as it's approaching ISS, coming up the R bar to its, to its capture point. Of course, this is a time lapse, so this is sped up about 40 times actual. There's the Canada arm reaching out and grabbing it. And you can see here as Cygnus comes into view, gets positioned just uh, over the Node 1 Nader CBM port and then attached. So very successful mission. We're very happy to work that one with our orbital, well, at that time, orbital ATK. Now our Northrop Grumman counterparts. It was a very nice mission. The next month, uh, SpaceX mission CRS-15 came to the ISS. You can see there in the middle of the screen as the uh, Dragon's approaching. Uh, you can see in the bottom center, you can see the solar array of the Cygnus. It was there at the time. Here comes the Falcon. See, it's maneuvering to its capture point. The Canada arm is positioning itself. You can see the Dragon coming up. You can see the slight wobble. That's the attitude control thrusters. It's orbital night, so the crew in this case wanted to wait till orbital day, so it's going to hover there for a few moments. Here comes sunrise, and there's the grapple. So uh, at, in this particular case, we had um, Cygnus on Node 1 Nader. So um, we put uh, Dragon on Node 2 Nader. You can see it's maneuvering around. 
Again, this is vastly sped up from what uh, it is in real time. We've got alignment, rotation of the solar arrays. There we go, final alignment and then birthing. So really very beautiful sight, uh, especially to have two commercial vehicles up there at the same time. In the future, we look forward to having even more up there simultaneously. The next clip is uh, of our Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser that was their uh, engineering flight test. It happened in November of 2017. Uh, very successful test. You can see as, uh, as it's dropped from a Chinook, something over 12,000 feet. Um, I think Steve and his team got to exercise all the control surfaces, reached about half a Mach from what I understand, uh, coming in at the Edwards Landing Strip. Very nice lineup with the front skid and then landing. So it was a very, very successful flight test. So congratulations to Steve and his team on that. So um, of course, you know, the major reason um, we have CRS is to resupply the station. And the major um, unique things that we bring up there, all the research. You heard uh, Mike earlier from Nanorax. Uh, in the top left, you can see their CubeSat deployer. We've flown a number of those now uh, on the Northrop Grumman vehicles. Uh, there's RNA sequencing, there's algae cultivation, the AngiX cancer therapy. So there's really a very broad range of science that we're conducting today on board Space Station, which is enabled by the commercial resupply vehicles. Um, you can see to date, ISS, we're hitting 20 years uh, later this year, uh, next month as a matter of fact, over 2,500 investigations. Um, and many hundreds of those were brought to the space station by the commercial um, fleet. So it's really been a tremendous success at this point. Let's see, so by the numbers, um, up through SpaceX CRS-15 and OA-9, the CRS-1 providers have delivered 120,000 pounds of science critical spares and consumables to the ISS. They far surpassed the um, the original requirement to deliver 20 metric tons each, which is a tremendous thing, and they're both well into their extension flights. It's been such a success, of course, everybody's heard that we have now awarded the CRS-2 contracts and added a vendor as well. Uh, notably, since the last time we sat here, SpaceX has now flown uh, three more reused Dragons to the ISS, bringing the total to four. Uh, we've also flown on three reused Falcons as well, uh, making it the first three reused Falcons uh, of any government user. So those are some notable achievements in just in the last year. Um, CRS-2, we're well underway. Uh, those ISS integration milestones are, are uh, making excellent progress. Uh, Sierra Nevada is developing a very capable vehicle we're looking forward to utilizing as soon as it's ready. Northrop Grumman continues to, to uh, implement uh, improvements to the fleet of Cygnus vehicles uh, tailored to our research users. And um, the SpaceX team uh, is uh, on the verge of starting their first Dragon 2 enhanced Dragon spacecraft, so we're very much looking forward to what the future holds there. Uh, looking back, it was only six years ago this week, last Monday as a matter of fact, uh, that CRS-1 first visited ISS. Next month, assuming our flight plan holds in, in light of current situation, but next month uh, with NG-10 and SpaceX-16, uh, those will represent the 25th and 26th commercial missions just since 2012, so really uh, a great achievement by, by the panel members here. Uh, so that's it. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I wanted to hand it off to uh, each of our panel members to say a few introductory words. So, Bob. Okay, I guess I'll uh, start. You know, as we were waiting to come up here, Kathy Leaders and I were talking about this, and uh, I was the program manager during the development phase and counterpart to uh, Kathy at the time. And boy, it's just great to see all of these vehicles flying, but I think even more gratifying to see the cadence that they're flying. And your, your video just really put that in perspective in such a great way to sort of summarize it that way. Of course, you, you did what we often do in this business, which is make it look really easy. And um, we all know that there's uh, really fairly large teams behind uh, these things and people that really have to put their heart and soul in these uh, products because um, it's, it's not really that easy. It's a lot, a lot harder and uh, to really maintain the mission success and the attention to detail, uh, super, uh, super hard, super important, 
and events today in you know Kazakhstan show you know how how difficult this uh, this is. So anyway, with that uh, thought, why don't we take the first uh, slide? In this phase where uh, you know we've uh, now become part of uh, Northrop Grumman, where the innovation innovation system sector I kind of feel in these conferences, it's a good opportunity to introduce that to the group. I think the the group and the, and the understanding of the uh, Northrop Grumman with this added uh, scale, this added uh, scope is now being more and more understood, but um, it's really great to include the human spaceflight element into the other great things that Northrop Grumman is doing. And, uh, you know, this is not to go through all those different uh, things, but when you combine what's happening in the DOD space world, the civil space world, human spaceflight, it's uh, really an interesting uh, combination and I think it's really going to uh, lead to interesting things in the future, which a lot of this panel is about the sort of what are the fu future capabilities, et cetera. Um, in the area that I'm in, you can see um, in the Space Systems Group and the Advanced Programs Division, uh, these are the exact products we work with. And this is basically uh, the part of our sector that starts in space. And if it starts in space and then does a mission, whether it's commercial satellites, human space flight or even uh, satellite servicing that I spoke on yesterday, you know, it all comes in uh, our area. And we're trying to maximize the synergy between these products as well as the broader Northrop uh, Grumman uh, products. And hopefully, uh, you know, again, a very good uh, story there. Um, I'm going to do somewhat of the same thing as Vin just did, which is uh, highlight the last uh, mission. We're all very proud of uh, how that came out. It was a very flawless mission starting at uh, launch on May and <clears throat> in, excuse me, then into the uh, phasing and into the uh, actual uh, grapple. The, the th thing I would point out about this is when you get everything all tuned up and with the use of modern uh, navigation systems like LIDAR and differential GPS, it's just amazing how accurate these vehicles fly in. And um, the, the picture that I like the best is not, not this picture, and, and it was also not in Ven's uh, video, but there's a camera on the uh, robotic arm that the, the space station controls. And it's looking out, so it's seeing what the uh, end effector sees. And multiple missions, it sure looks to me that we almost fly the Cygnus into the end effector as opposed to the other way around. It's it just extremely accurate at what you can do, again, with LIDAR that measures distance so, so uh, uh, carefully and so accurately. And uh, very, very smooth uh, rendezvous, very, very smooth grapple. They just basically have to move the end effector just sort of just slightly forward and then capture occurs. We're very uh, particularly uh, proud of uh, J.R. Thompson and his uh, role in the space uh, world because he, he uh, crosses between government and uh, industry. He was at uh, Heritage Orbital and Orbital ATK as the chief uh, operating officer and president for many, many years, and I considered him a, a personal uh, mentor, but on the uh, NASA side, helped develop the uh, RL-10, was the program manager on the SSME, was the associate administrator of the entire of NASA, and was a center director at Marshall Space Flight Center. So really a, a, a neat guy and a neat uh, mentor. And you can see, we, uh, that's what the astronauts saw when they opened the hatch. We always try and you know, leave a, a few things for them to uh, See, because they're all anxious to get in into a uh, cargo vehicle of whether it's Dragon or whether it's Cygnus uh, to get fresh food and uh, you know all kinds of stuff. So anyway, um, what's not talked about as much is, but is equally important, is taking uh, trash away, particularly with the continuous uh, presence and the number of astronauts they have on board. They generate a lot of uh, trash, and you wouldn't really know it, but the upper right, what you're seeing there is the just before closing the hatch and departing, and all that kind of jumble of stuff, a lot of it is, uh, you know, just kind of strapped in place, is uh, disposal cargo or trash, 
and it's filled up from front to back uh, completely. So that's, that's another uh, Im important uh, thing. And then I think in the question and answer period, I'll speak in, in uh, more details, but um, Cygnus from the beginning, the, the Kathy Leader's days till today, has really increased in capability quite a bit um, in terms of overall cargo capacity, uh, volume, and then services. And that's looking ahead to the future, that's where we're really going to be focusing is adding new services to the uh, Cygnus, more interfaces like the first bullet, power data, communication, uh, more specialized interfaces for science because the, uh, that's the main focus of the space station right now is uh, scientific utilization and a lot of these experiments they're sending up are fairly sophisticated and have specialized interfaces. We're also doing more, we've done this already and we'll do more of it, is instead of taking an experiment up in the Cygnus, moving it into the station, then turning it on and operating it, you can leave it in the Cygnus, turn it on in the Cygnus and uh, perform the experiment. This doesn't work for all experiments, but certainly a good share of them. And we've, we can connect into the payload ethernet um, that's on station directly from Cygnus uh, while we're uh, berthed. So that kind of ties Cygnus directly into the science uh, side of things, um, you know. And then what we haven't done but we're uh, close on is a free flyer capability where we could uh, unberth, go away, perform long duration, un undisturbed microgravity, and then come back if necessary. We're kind of uh, foreshadowing manufacturing in space. Um, so I've uh, been working on that uh, quite a bit under various studies and other things, and that's certainly uh, a bit of the uh, future. We'll, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the question and answers. So that's, that's it. Over to you. All right. Steve. See if I have anything here. Can you bring my charts up, please? You want to go? Sure. <laughs> Why don't you go? I could brief these charts, but probably not very well. We could trade. We, we could fun. trade. Yeah, yeah, it'd be fun. We'd be different. Um, hi, I'm Benji Reed. I'm the director of uh, crew mission management at SpaceX. Um, it's always an honor to be here and um, great opportunity that Pat and, um, and the university and everybody puts together. We really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and also, um, uh, great to be here with Ben. Um, as we always say, NASA is um, you know, our number one, and we, we love NASA and all of the, the work and opportunity that we get to be able to do with them. <coughs> um, just kind of give an overview of what, we're, what we've been doing, what we're, what we're heading towards with the cargo program. Um, obviously, we've been continuing to partner for regular and reliable commercial cargo resupply services to and from ISS. Um, right now, we're under 26 resupply mission contracts between Cirrus 1 and Cirrus 2. Um, it's actually just uh, six years ago this month that CRS-1 went up, so it's pretty exciting. Um, and uh, and so it's, it's actually a, a, good, a good month, because we also just had our anniversary of uh, um, the first successful launch of Falcon 1 as well, um, so just in the last, uh, last month. Um, anyway, Dragon has visited ISS more than any other cargo vehicle in 2017. We're continuing to keep up a, a strong record. And, um, as Ben mentioned, um, depending on uh, what, what needs to come out of um, today's events, um, right now we're scheduled for uh, our CR-16 uh, flight for later this year. Um, uh, we also have a little video. I think Ben's are really cool videos, but I've got a cool one too. We can go ahead and play that. Um, I like this one that was shot uh, quite a bit from the station. As Dragon departs, this is Dragon departing from station. I think this is the last mission. Um, and uh, going out there on the arm, being taken away, unberthed, and then uh, and then released. But it's uh, just a beautiful shot, and that's one of the big things that um, that we try to provide um, for the community uh, with Dragon and our return services, um, bringing back um, lots of payloads and um, uh, science and, and other materials for for study, including various pieces of the station and whatnot that need to be investigated or, or refurbished. <clears throat> so up to now, where, where do we stand now? <clears throat> we, 
We've successfully flown to and from the station, um, from to station 15 times. Um, we've delivered tens of thousands of uh, pounds of cargo, and I, I think if I remember right, we're close to about 100,000 pounds, um, it seems like, in terms of total delivery and return, um, including science, um, living organisms. We've been transporting um, uh, living organisms for uh, on a number of flights for quite a while. Um, and uh, and have a you know have an ecosystem actually that runs on the cargo or on the cargo vehicles and the Dragon One vehicles, um, which is all part of our build up towards crew as well. Um, and it is currently the only vehicle capable of returning significant scientific downmass to ISS. Um, and of course, looking forward to seeing Dream, Dream Chaser come online to help out with that as well. Falcon Nine has successfully flown over 60 missions, um, including 35 since January of 2017. And I think it's important to note that when we talk about Falcon, that, that is also in the context of um, NASA and ISS and the cargo, the CRS program specifically. Um, the, uh, the Falcon was developed as part of that program, um, Falcon 9. And so it's always with um, um, a great honor that we get to continue providing those services to NASA and continuing developing and evolving the capabilities of the Falcon 9 family. Um, we've been accruing flight heritage faster than any other American launch vehicle today. And, um, our Falcon 9 Block 5 launched for the first time earlier this year and is, is, is now accruing heritage. And, um, and the crew configuration um, of Block 5 is what we'll be flying American astronauts on. Um, so the uh, reusability is a, is a great uh, and important topic that you know, we, we've talked a lot about, we've talked about here in this conference in previous years and, and been touched on it as well. Um, in terms of this, because reusability not only is a, a critical factor in driving down the cost of access to space, but um, also towards reliability and safety. It helps us to um, build that kind of reliability when you build the amount of reusability that you need to have into the vehicles, um, the, the robustness, that also increases your reliability. It also allows you to, to see your vehicles and inspect them, return them, and, and, and understand what you're gonna do when you're gonna reuse them again. Um, Dragon spacecraft uh, supported the CRS-9 mission. This is the C CRS-15 um, uh, case study. But the, uh, the uh, Dragon spacecraft supported CRS-9 mission in July of 2016. That Falcon booster that took CRS-15 up was also um, the test mission in April of 2018. And then um, CRS-15 launched in June. So um, fairly quick turnaround, especially on the Falcon. Um, and we're always moving for um, faster and faster refurbishment and capability to return all of our vehicles to flight. Um, four Dragons have completed the reflights of the ISS. Two flight-proven Falcon 9s have been used on CRS missions. Um, and then three Falcon 9s have been reflown after supporting CRS missions. Um, and so it's, um, it's, it's great. It's, it's about building up a fleet of vehicles that can be used um, again and again for multiple customers. Um, and that's really um, the, where I wanted to end. Um, I know we'll have Q&A and talk a little bit more about where things are heading and what's going on. Vin touched on. Dragon 2 coming um, online for, uh, for crew and as well for cargo, um, and um, a number of other applications and opportunities. OK. Uh, well, it's great to be here uh, to get a chance to talk about this. Um, I took a little different approach that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to give you a little bit of status of our program, our CRS2 program, how we're doing on Dream Chaser. But then I want to focus the rest of my remarks more toward the tipping point commercialization side and kind of give you our perspective on that, how that's going. And I think that's, you know, that's been the theme of this conference and, and I think that's probably where, where, where the, uh, this conversation is gonna go here later. So let me jump into it. Um, and I think probably everybody knows what our system is by now, but I'll just kind of refresh for everybody. Um, essentially, we designed a system optimized for the CRS2 program. Uh, using our Dream Chaser spacecraft, uh, which is about 85 to 90 percent common with what our crew version of the spacecraft is. Um, we uh, did some things like we, uh, we uh, made the wings so they would fold in or fold out on orbit, which allowed us to fly under a, a, a five meter fairing and get a lot more up mass to orbit uh, through higher Q on ascent. Took away the windows, which was really disappointing for a pilot like me, but uh, we figured the cargo probably didn't need to see out. Um, and, uh, but other than that, the vehicle is pretty much the same as the uh, crewed version. Uh, attached to that vehicle, we put a cargo module on the back, and the cargo module is optimized for two things. It's op optimized for pressurized payload uh, for the ISS requirements, but also optimized with uh, three stations for unpressurized payload um, um, for you know, science experiments and, and ORUs for space station and things like that. So that's why the shape is the way it is. 
Uh, we can dock or berth, and we also uh, have power and thermal on the cargo module, which supplements the vehicle so that we can stay not only on orbit for long periods of time, but also in free flight and do free flight science missions with the same vehicle. We're capable of carrying powered payloads uh, both internally and externally, provide all the power and data communications to a uh, space station, both while we're docked or berthed and also while we're in free flight. Um, but, and then uh, probably the, the biggest, uh, biggest thing and the, and the reason we went with this approach to begin with is our ability to uh, Enter, uh, we do the deorbit burn, the cargo module burns up uh, on entry, but the Dream Chaser has at least 15 times reusable. We land on a runway, which allows us for, uh, particularly for science payloads, to be able to come down under low Gs during entry, much like the space shuttle, about one and a half Gs, and then land on a runway. Um, we also design the vehicle with uh, no toxic chemicals on board so that when we land, uh, you can walk up to the vehicle immediately, open the hatch, and unload the cargo, and particularly get to critical science. And so we were always specifically designed uh, with that purpose. Uh, we try to leverage all the lessons learned from the space shuttle program and all of the lifting bodies that have been out there in the past and, and apply that to this program. A little bit about the history, <coughs> because since we're, you know, we're talking about uh, commercialization and things like that, our intent from the very, very beginning, which goes really go back to about 2004, 2005 with this vehicle, was to be commercial. We obviously were very interested in being a provider to the space station for crew and cargo. However, that was not our primary motivation for getting into this in the beginning. Our, my former boss uh, had, had a vision or, or had a strategic vision, saw this coming, uh, the commercialization that we're seeing today, and wanted to, uh, wanted to do that. And so he looked for a, specifically for a technology to do the things that I'm talking about. And actually, we, this actually originated in the HL20 program that NASA started, uh, that NASA Langley ran for about 12 years um, uh, back in the kind of mid 80s to mid 90s. And uh, we actually went to Mike Griffin at the time and asked him, can we license this technology? So we actually licensed the HL20 technology from NASA we converted that into the Dream Chaser, and that's, that's the history. So that it was the first real, probably one of the biggest technology transfers ever of uh, technology from the government to private industry to use. And so that's kind of our heritage, and that's where we came from. Uh, with this vehicle, we're not just looking at uh, missions to the space station for CRS-2, although that is our 99% focus right now, is to meet NASA's requirements and deliver uh, cargo on time where they need it when they need it. But we're also looking at other missions, whether they be free flight <coughs> missions, missions with other customers, missions with other nations, and other applications of the vehicle as well. Um, where we are in the program right now, uh, Vin showed you the picture of the uh, flight test. What was unique about the flight test for us, it was like our enterprise, uh, atmospheric flight test vehicle. But what you may not know is we actually had orbital vehicle avionics in that vehicle. So we had a triplex flight computer. We had dual GPS INSs. We had dual radar altimeters. Um, and we had the flight software that we'll actually use on the orbital vehicle when we're coming into to doing approach and landing. And so we actually got, um, if you will, real flight test data on our real orbital vehicle avionics sure. and, and flight software as part of that test which helped jumpstart us and also buy down a lot of risk going into the, into the rest of this. Where we are right now is we're, we're nearly through CDR. We just have a couple of subsystems uh, outstanding left to go through their final CDRs, and we're rapidly uh, headed into production. I won't go through all of the pictures uh, below, but it's a lot of hardware. We have hardware, flight hardware being built all over the place, um, and we're working on it. Um, and. Uh, we are expecting to get our prime, we have one primary structure already in our facility that we'll be using, that we're undergoing a, a, a structural testing with. Our second flight article um, structure is being built by uh, Lockheed Martin, uh, the, the F-35 guys down in Fort Worth. We expect to get that at the end of this year. And then we'll be into full up assembly integration and test targeting a launch around the end of 2020. So, that's kind of where we, uh, we stand on progress, making great progress. Um, for those of you who have ever been through this process, you know that when you hit CDR and then you go into production, every day gets harder than the last one. And so that's the phase we're in right now. But uh, I'm happy to say we have an awesome team, a uh, great team of engineers and procurement folks, and uh, they're all working really hard to make this happen. So I want to switch gears now and talk a little bit about um, 
you know, enabling commercialization. And I think NASA has done a fantastic job, and they've been focused on this for a long time to help enable this commercialization. And, and one of the things that's really uh, been, been really invested in is public-private partnership programs. Uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation, we've been involved in a lot of these, uh, of several of the, of the previous uh, Space Act Agreement programs. Uh, CRS2 is a public-private partnership. Um, and, and what that means is that the, the company is co-investing with the government uh, to get things done. And, uh, and so it helps reduce the government cost. And, uh, but, but then we invest as well, so we both have stakes. We kind of share the risk among us and try to move faster um, in a more streamlined fashion. Um, on the other side of my group, we're actually working uh, a number of areas for Next Step 2 on the, on the Lunar Gateway. I won't talk about the details of that here, but those are also public-private partnerships where we're working, working closely with NASA on that to develop that, um, as well as the power and propulsion element, which is the first element of the gateway. And then most recently, we were uh, one of the companies awarded the study for the commercialization of low Earth orbit, which is really pertinent to our panel today, um, where we're looking at the future, where NASA wants to become you know, one of many customers in low Earth orbit, commercialize low Earth orbit, and then enable NASA to go off and do the exploration uh, that, that, that they want to move on to as well, while preserving the capability to do human uh, spaceflight in low Earth orbit in the future. Um, so in light of that, uh, I just put together a couple charts here of kind of what we see from an SNC standpoint is the advantages of these private partnership, public-private partnerships as well as the disadvantages. Um, this has been done for a long time in different names, um, but it's still been going on for quite a while. Um, it, uh, the advantage is it saves the government money, it reduces the risk. We share, share risk among, among us. We've probably saved hundreds of millions of dollars with NASA on both the cargo and the crew programs, I would imagine. Um, and I'm sure there will be assessment of that done someday. Um, where we, we assume the risk in the development program, and we're, but we're looking at payoff and services and other commercial business in the future. And we also can streamline things, uh, escape some of the challenges of the FARs, and uh, ho hopefully allow us to go faster. It drives business, uh, provides government money to help augment our investments, product development, establish new markets, and, and uh, help sustain the commercial market. And finally, it's good for the in United States because it allows us to establish leadership in new global markets. But here are the pitfalls. Um, it can be used in inappropriate situations. And when I look at these, I always look at, you know, the government's obviously wanting to do this to save money, enable the commercial market, but there has to be a commercial market to enable. And it's very important to look at the, uh, the, the intersection of objectives between uh, the government and, uh, and the company and make sure there's a big enough intersection that, that there's real benefit. Um, the, the risk is always a challenge for us. Um, I can tell you we've invested heavily in CRS2, and as a result, it's a risk for us. It's a much bigger risk than, than a normal contract would be, so we have to watch that very carefully. Um, it can potentially reduce competition. If, there, if there's a large company investment required, not all companies can make that investment, and, and you may be eliminating an innovative small company that can't afford to get into the game. And expanding it, which is, I think is our next challenge when we commercialize low Earth orbit, is when you start talking about multiple companies and you start talking about multiple countries, how do you expand this partnership? And so those, it's kind of uh, Steve's quick and dirty thoughts on public-private partnerships and the advantages and disadvantages of how you should use these. And that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Steve. Let's see. I have some questions, and we'll also like to invite some from the audience as well. Let's see, for uh, any of our panelists, um, what will it take to reach the commercial resupply tipping point, and what else might be needed? Anything along the lines of policy changes, extended ISS operations, more commercial-to-commercial -commercial interactions, and I'll just open that up. Well, the thought I had on this, and others will undoubtedly add to it, is cadence. You know, the, the cadence is so important in, in this particular uh, thing because it just becomes an enabler to commercial activity on itself. If you can uh, have an experiment, if the experiment doesn't quite you know, meet the uh, schedule for the ride, there's a ride coming right after it. It's a much more flexible uh, situation, and it, it is a positive reinforcer for all kinds of commercial activities. I, uh, sure, I, I fully agree with Cadence. I think that's very important. I, I also think um, you know duration and, and long-term planning ability. So, 
you know, uh, maintaining funding for the station and keeping the station running as long as possible and, and really building upon the, the great value to, you know, to the American taxpayer and also to the, the world science. I think that's really important. So knowing that you can have that out there and that that's going to be a, a destination, right? You have to have a destination as well. So I think that's important. Yeah, I would, I would agree with both of them. The destination is really important. Cadence is really important. You know, you need a, you need a continual, for us to, for us to continue, you need a continual uh, demand, if you will, to go with the supply. And so it's important to keep the demand up. And, and the key to that is being flexible, uh, having lots of options, having a destination to go to that's reasonably caught, uh, priced. And then, and then again, what I said earlier is the intersection between the government objectives and the commercial objectives. Make sure there's enough intersection there that, that all entities are always interested in, in working together to make this happen. All right, all right thank you. Let's see, uh, does the CRS procurement model translate well to future public-private partnerships, including those beyond LEO? Maybe you should go first on this yeah. one. I, so on that some <laughs> I guess I already, We've already heard your, why did I talk about your that? Answer. Answer. <laughs> uh, so it's really, it's a really interesting question. You know, one of the things I didn't mention is that because in, in my group, you know, we're working a Cirrus 2 and we're working all the Dream Chaser things, which includes other commercial missions of Dream Chaser, all kinds of things like a UN mission we're working on that you may have heard about and things like that. And then we're also involved in the exploration. And then we're involved in the commercial LEO piece of this that's going on. Um, we're, I feel like we're getting a really good look all the way across the spectrum of what the future architecture of both LEO and lunar space in the exploration space is looking like kind of looking at those and, and seeing how they tie together. Um, on the public-private partnership side, let's take, uh, let's take the, the lunar exploration stuff that's going on. So you look at the gateway. Gateway's designed uh, to be a public-private partnership where companies invest. So then it gets to the, the point I made earlier is that where do the, where do the, um, where do NASA and the commercial companies' uh, interests intersect? And where those interests intersect is where the company is going to invest. So if you take that partnership, now we look at LEO, it's the same thing. Where do the company's uh, objectives and the commercial objectives and NASA's objectives uh, intersect? Where, they're in, where they intersect, we can take advantage of these public-private partnerships and reduce you know, costs for the government and uh, enable us to be commercial and provide that. Where it's a purely commercial thing, where th there is no government interest in it, then the commercial folks are going to need to pay for it. And then where there are NASA objectives or other government objectives that don't intersect the commercial, then they're going to have to pay for it. So hopefully you can design a system that's flexible enough to handle both of those things. And in the perfect services world model, then each of those organizations would essentially pay to play where they wanted to play. So I think it can be done. When you start adding international partners in and different other things and the other things that NASA needs, it gets a lot more complex. And that's why VIN and ISS programming to go figure that out for us, right? <laughs> We're trying. Yeah. Yeah. 20 years, we're still working on that. Yeah, I know. One thing I'd add to that is that the use of commercial development standards and the use of performance-based requirements um, I think is a guaranteed win-win uh, when those are applied to these, uh, these programs like, like CRS and like some of the cislunar activities. When you talk cislunar, though, I have some of the same uh, thoughts because our company is doing similar studies as uh, Steve's is uh, doing. And, you know, uh, cislunar really has much more of a, a feel of uh, exploration to it and exploitation will come, but right now it's more exploration. And so that has the, the uh, so that relates to what he commented on, on the uh, intersection of the private and public interests. So that's, um, you know, a thought there. And then one final uh, thought, which was just a little history lesson on COTS CRS uh, development. So COTS was for a demonstration phase to take cargo to the Interna International uh, Space Station. CRS was a service-based phase, but uh, the government did do a really good thing, which was aggregate uh, market demand to, together uh, of six missions. So there was a minimum buy of six missions. And that was very helpful in, in uh, selling it within a corporate environment and driving down the risk 
associated with uncertainty of, of what was NASA's future plans and that kind of stuff. So using those types of methodologies I think are good if they're applied into other areas like cislunar. Okay. Benji, did you want to offer anything? No, oh, I, I agree with, I think performance-based requirements are really important. Um, I, and I agree with the aggregate of knowing, you, it's sort of like the sim, similar argument with, you know, knowing how long you have a destination up there, keeping station up. It's also about knowing, um, you know, that you have a certain buy. Um, and just in general, I think firm fixed price contract approach and mentality is super important because it's what you do in the commercial world anyway, generally speaking. I mean, as a commercial provider, a real commercial market, a real marketplace is about, you know, here's a, here's a product or service, here's a payment that, I, you know, here's a price for that. And, and uh, hopefully those are going to match up and, I, and the risk is on me as a, as a provider to, to make sure I'm going to come through and come out with the appropriate, you know, in game financially while providing the safe and reliable service for the, for the, for the government or for whoever the customer is. So firm fixed price contracting constantly promotes that, um, that approach that I think is key to overall commercialization of space. Thank you. Let's see, I've got one other one, but uh, I'll do that at the end. All right. Uh, I've got, gentlemen, I've got some questions for the, from the audience for you, so please keep sending them in. These are good and getting all sorts of votes, so uh, get ready here. Um, Benji, this first one is for you. So uh, this morning at the ASAP meeting, uh, some uh, members mentioned some anomalies with uh, Dragon parachutes. Um, what issues have the parachutes had and what are their impacts on commercial crew? You know, the, the great thing about um, being able to do all of the testing that we're doing on the parachutes for crew, um, as well as the opportunity on Dragon to constantly be using our parachute systems, it just gives us a chance to collect a lot of data. And so we're constantly learning and, and growing through that data and, and applying that to ensuring that the ultimate parachute system that will fly for crew, as well as for cargo missions, um, will be safe. Um, and so we just continue that process. Excellent. Um, Bob, this one is for you. So uh, to what extent is, uh, is Northrop still committed to using Antares uh, as the, the Cygnus launch vehicle, um, uh, considering you know, uh, you've got Omega coming on board? Are there other launch vehicles that you're considering going forward? Well, you take everything you know, one step at a time, but really the next uh, whole series of missions, we're 100% sure they're going to be on Antares. You know, over the long term, as we, um, assuming we uh, develop this product into cislunar capable uh, type of system, which, you know, we're certainly interested in, and uh, certainly participating in a lot of the studies on what is the gateway going to look like, and, and could a Cygnus-derived vehicle make some contribution to the uh, gateway. So we're looking at all that, and that's beyond Antares' launch capability. So for sure, when you move on to Cislunar, you're going to need um, upgraded capability, you know, maybe uh, Mega even. That's, that was certainly a big win for us uh, yesterday. And there was congratulations. A, uh, and cr congratulations to you oh, as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of smiles uh, yesterday about that. So. You know, just to add on to that, too, I think that uh, Northrop Grumman, you know, Orbital at the time showed a lot of agility uh, after the Orbit 3 anomaly by, you know, it wasn't just Antares all the way through. It was a, a different version of Antares with different engines, and, and it was putting Cygnus on a different uh, rocket for a while on Atlas and then mm -hmm. developing a new version of Antares. So I really think that that really demonstrates the agility that um, industry is capable of. So it was really very impressive. Excellent. Agreed. Thank you, man. Uh, Benji, I might go back to you uh, quickly for, uh, uh, for a question here. So uh, a couple of years ago at ISPCS, uh, trying to remember uh, wh which representative said this, but it said that your, your ECLIS program would be easier, your ECLIS system would be easy to put uh, onto your, your crewed vehicle because you just have to basically add oxygen. Um, knowing no, what you know now, uh, can you comment on that? Can you update us on, on where that stands? <laughs> well, I don't know about that comment. Um, or where it was said, but uh, certainly we have a, a good ecosystem system that's running on Dragon 1 right now for cargo, as I mentioned, um, and, and as always has been planned to expand that appropriately um, to meet the needs of flying crew um, and to meet all the requirements there and ensure the crew will be safe. So, um, you know, we've done a number of things to expand, including the, the capability to carry the various gases that you need in order to do that. Um, and scrub the air clean and, and, and whatnot. But, uh, but that's come along well. One of our early milestones that we had uh, last year was uh, the completion of the ECLIS module test 
um, which was really important. We actually built a full version of Dragon from the, basically the, the, the shell of Dragon and then a full interior with a running ECLIS system. Um, and then ran that system closed with people inside, with human subjects. And actually a lot of the engineers themselves who designed the system are, are in there testing it. And, um, and so then we run that. We make sure that that whole system will work and you know, maintain all the key metrics that you need, temperature and humidity and carbon dioxide levels and oxygen levels. And, and, uh, and that went very well. That was a great milestone. So we feel confident about the, the progress we're making and, and what it's taken to get there. Excellent. Uh, Steve, one for you, kind of going back to the, uh, the launch vehicle question. Uh, obviously, you've got an agreement with ULA for an Atlas V. Mm -hmm. Are you considering other launch vehicles? So, good question. We're, of course, looking at uh, all launch vehicles out there. We, we specifically designed our vehicle to fit under a five-meter fairing uh, from the very beginning, and we uh, are, are, when you start talking about commercialization, the ability to fly other missions, it's not just missions necessarily for the United States, it may be missions out of Europe or Japan or just about anywhere. Along those lines, we're looking at all launch vehicles that are capable of carrying us, and so we're, we're doing a study on that right now. Um, and, and from a commercial standpoint, you know, one of the, one of the things that's exciting that I think is really enabling commercialization, I think everybody in the room knows this, is launch vehicle prices are coming down. You started by SpaceX and everybody else is, uh, is doing that as well. And w when those launch vehicle prices come down, which by the way is about 80% of our costs on every mission we fly, that, in, that opens up the commercial market. And so we're obviously looking at the commercial market as well. All the uh, launch vehicle providers doing what they're doing is, is providing opportunity for us and we wanna look at our opportunities and see what we can do. So we, we are still on an Atlas. Uh, we're gonna fly our first flight on the Atlas and we haven't made any decisions to move off of Atlas, but uh, we are looking at all those vehicles. Excellent. And so you're uh, obviously, clearly, you've got the, the CRS launches. Are you looking to other markets for Dream Chaser? Can you update the, the audience oh, on that? Other markets? Um, we've been in discussions for years with, uh, with uh, other, other countries around the world. One of the really exciting things, we, we established, I think, the first ever partnership between a commercial company and the United Nations. Uh, in the, the, the UN mission that you may have heard about in the news, we work with the uh, UNOSA, United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, and we established this relationship, and they put out a call for ideas last year. And the idea is to um, provide nations that don't have access to space or wouldn't normally have access to space the opportunity to design and build and fly a, uh, a science experiment uh, on board our vehicle. And we get 25 or 30 of those experiments, experiments, depending on what they are. We would partner these countries that have never uh, b been in space with spacefaring nations that are already in space to help them and mentor them and then provide this, uh, this global UN mission. Now, where we launch from and where we land from in that mission will kind of depend on how things work out. It's UN, the UN has kind of the lead on this and we're we're working with them on it. So that's an example of, uh, of other missions we're looking at. And there are other nations, you know, the space station has a, it has a great international partnership, um, but we all know who those partners are. And there's a lot of countries out there in the world uh, that are not part of the space station that would like to be in space also. And so we're looking at providing opportunities for them in the future. Um, one of our uh, things that we've been exploring is if we can, for the price, roughly the price of a satellite launch, satellite launch, provide a turnkey mission for your nation, and then because of our vehicle design, we can actually land in your country on your runway, um, there's a huge amount of interest in that as well. So those are the kinds of things we're working on. Do you have an update on, uh, on those studies as well as, I think one of the key questions is, who's gonna pay for it? How does, how does the funding mechanism work? Uh, so the UN mission is being worked through the UN, so I probably can't comment on that. On the other missions, uh, we're looking at multiple ways to do that, um, how we're going to fund it. I can't, obviously, I can't go into the specifics at this time on how that's going to be done. Okay, fair enough. Um, ben, I'm going to send this question to you. So what kind of commercial opportunities uh, do you see in NASA's exploration plans? Obviously, you've had quite a bit of success so far with, uh, with cargo and, and crew uh, here shortly. What What's next? Let's see. We're, I think the, the doors are open. Mines are, you know, um, folks, um, right now, we're, I think we're on this very uh, much of a supporting commercialization 
uh, wave, I would say, and, and hopefully it's more, is longer lasting than wave. You know, we have our international partners, but we've also shown what the commercial partners can do, and it's really impressive uh, what's, you know, half a dozen, you know, 10 years ago, as Kathy was starting this whole thing out, frankly, a lot of folks didn't know whether it could be done or not. Firm fixed price, public-private partnerships, um, industry assumes some of the risks, has skin in the game with uh, their own, um, with their own independent funding. So um, I think, you know, as we go forward, it's going to be very interesting to see what part as commercial and international partners compete for parts of these programs. Because even today, even with the beginnings of Gateway, mm -hmm. we're already seeing um, overlapping and comp as well as complementary um, capabilities. So I, I think it's right, wide open right now. Great. Keep the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Benji, I might send it back to you. Um, so once you've got uh, Crew Dragon, does Cargo Dragon go away? Do you use basically one system? Do you have both of the systems going? How do you envision that, that working out operationally? Sure. sure, that's a great question. So right now we're flying cargo on what we call Dragon 1, so the first Dragon that we developed. And then um, we're, de we're developing Dragon 2, so it's the, the, the updated version of Dragon, which is designed to carry both cargo and crew. There's a cargo variant and a crew variant. Um, obviously, the crew variant has seats. The cargo variant, um, you know, has, doesn't have the seats. There's a lot more space just to put in a lot of cargo. There's a um, significantly expanded cargo capability on Dragon 2 from Dragon 1. And um, there's a transition plan where our intention would be to go to, you know, fly Dragon 2s for everything. So, to, to be clear, is it directly modular that you just, you know, take out a seat and put in a, a, a payload rack or whatever it may be? Or will there be a basically a cargo Dragon 2 and a crew Dragon 2. Sure, no, there's, it's, it's fundamentally the same Dragon, so we continue to get the great same heritage and practice through um, flying those Dragons, um, but the interior, there are, there are differences that you build into it. Okay, great. Uh, Bob, can you talk a little bit more about uh, how Cygnus works? So um, we had uh, astronaut Mark Van Hyde yesterday here, and he said uh, it's actually easier to dock can you talk about how the operations work? It's a great design. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> I think actually the, his, his question was um, about unloading it, if I recall correctly. And um, Cygnus is really designed with lots of volume in mind mm -hmm. and lots and lots of uh, cargo transfer bags, which is the standard mechanism to take logistics up to the space station. So we have more uh, a simpler secondary structure that's easier to, you know, move stuff in and out uh, rapidly from the, uh, you know, from the Cygnus. But it's a pretty flexible vehicle, and you know, it's certainly an important product for us. And so, things like secondary structure, you know, might change in the future. Mm -hmm. So. Was there an upgrade between uh, the Cygnus from CRS-1 to CRS-2? There, there's a whole series of upgrades, and, you know, a lot of this is like inside baseball, you know. If you're you got deep, a bunch dip, of inside baseball yeah, nerds here, so. I don't you, know if they're really this inside. I mean, it's just <laughs> really a lot of uh, details. But um, we've increased our overall cargo capability by about 75% from the first mission to current mission, and there's more to come. We've increased the number of possible cargo transfer bags that can be carried, again, by about 75, 80%. 80 uh, we had one block change that's already been, has already occurred between what we called the standard pressurized cargo module and the enhanced pressurized cargo module. So that was one of the, the step functions on being able to carry more cargo. And then we redid the secondary structure to make it more efficient to pack as well. Um, there's also been upgrades, uh, there's some upgrades still to come, like carrying rodents and, again, more of a focus on uh, science utilization, uh, late load, other things uh, like that, and um, a lot of avionics changes that had just made the vehicle fly cleaner and more accurately and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which it really seems uh, very solid at this point. Right. Excellent. Lots of learnings, obviously, from the flights. It's nothing yep. like getting up there and flying. Yep. Uh, question for, for the full panel here. Are, do, you, um, are, do you see any commercial opportunities uh, that are coming out of, uh, you know, out, of, uh, out of cargo, out of CRS, too? I mean, we can, you know, for crew, we can talk about it. Obviously, there are, there are organizations that are clearly trying to sell seats, but 
Do you see any direct, other than NASA, direct uh, commercial customers? So, I guess the comment I'll make is we get calls nearly every day now from other companies asking us if we have excess capability on our uh, CRS-2 missions to, uh, to fly their payloads. And uh, of course, Venn owns the, our whole manifest on, on our missions. But there's, if there's excess capability that NASA doesn't use, then these, they're, they're, like I said, it's, it's happening all the time now to us. And so we see opportunity for ride, share, uh, ride shares in the future um, uh, out there. And, uh, and, and the, the demand is there, for sure, for ride share. And we're seeing it all over the place. Ben, so. how do you feel about that? That's great. We, the way, so we, we purchased missions, so right, as long as uh, there's excess capacity, then absolutely, we want to encourage that. We also encourage direct commercial to commercial um, transactions, so, so we're fully supportive. Now, You're not worried our, about it from a risk standpoint? Or are we you do there to monitor? It. Yeah, if something's uh, inside the vehicle and it comes up to the space station and they open the hatch, it's a shared environment, so mm -hmm. we do care from a toxic standpoint, from a flammability mm -hmm. standpoint, and so forth. If it's coming up and along the way deploys something that, that may become orbital debris, then we care from that perspective as well. And we, we evaluate those things mm -hmm. um, as each of the providers uh, brings up ideas. Great. Anybody else want to comment on uh, commercial opportunities with your, with your craft? Certainly. Cheese? Any, any cheese companies cheese. knocking on your door? <laughs> um, that's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. <laughs> um, no, uh, I, certainly. You know, I mean, there's 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 lots of opportunities out there, um, and um, you know, as was mentioned, there's uh, I think there's a lot of folks that are interested in flying, doing ride shares, flying maybe just to stay in the vehicle. Um, people who are always looking for ways to get to station as well. So we also field calls that we that we send NASA's way to say, hey, these guys want to get involved. Um, uh, but then also, you know, as the overall Leo market expands. There's um, more and more opportunities, you know, private space stations, um, expanded uses of ISS. These are all areas where, you know, we, we tend to talk a lot about, you know, the crew potential and private passenger potential, but, but in reality, always you're going to need cargo. You're always going to need to deliver supplies and materials at least to support, you know, those crew. Um, but more likely there's, there's an activity going on. There's something that you're doing up there at that destination or those destinations. And so you have to deliver cargo for that as well. Great. Bob? I thought the uh, keynote from Nanorex, Mike Lewis, was uh, a good uh, uh, commentary on what's possible from a com commercialization uh, point of view. So. Great. Um, ben, I might direct this one towards you. Do you foresee a gap between ISS funding and a need for resupply of other vehicles in space, such as Gateway, uh, if they happen to take longer than, than originally expected, as happens in space programs? Every now yeah, and then. I mean, all those things are under active discussion. Um, the Gateway program is, is um, getting stood up at this time. He said, well, as far as um, ISS, I think everybody's seen that uh, there's a, a direction right now to, to stop federal funding after 2024. So, so right now, while well, we're working through all those um, scenarios and see what could be done, uh, if not 2024, then what other year might help bridge that gap uh, and if it's acceptable. And that's, that's a conversation that's happening, um, you know, far above me. Got it. Understood. Um, uh, Steve, why don't we go to you for here for a moment? So uh, obviously we've seen some of the upgrades or changes anyway that you've made to uh, to Dream Chaser, uh, including one of the uh, the uh, the extra module on the outside there. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, things that Dream Chaser can take back? Obviously we know about your up mass capabilities, but what happens once you uh, leave the station? So. Um if, you, if anybody's ever at our Colorado facility, you might be able to get a C. And most people don't realize how big our vehicle is on the inside and how much volume it actually has. One of the things that we did, you know, um, we, as I mentioned, we can berth or we can dock. And, and ISS generally prefers, and then you can correct me if I'm wrong, that we berth, and primarily because of the hatch size. Your berthing hatch size is much, uh, much larger than your docking hatch size and it allows the cargo transfer that, na that, that the uh, program needs uh, of these large bags like M3 bags. And so our hatches are sized for that for the berthing mission. But uh, what, what's nice about that for coming back, because of, of the large volume of our Dream Chaser itself, we can bring, bring home outsized or, or unusually sized cargo back. And like an example, one of the, one of the things that Space Station Program 
uh, spends a lot of time on and, and trying to maintain are things like the, uh, the EMUs, the spacesuits they use to do, the astronauts use to do spacewalks. So we can bring an EMU home, for example, or we can bring home just spend any kind of outsized cargo. And so, um, again, we can bring that back to a runway, um, and we can bring a lot back to a runway. And so I think uh, that's what it's looking at. The other thing that, um, that Vin continually reminds me of is you guys are, and Kirk Shireman does the same thing, you're about the science. We want you to bring the science home. Because we can bring home science at one and a half Gs like the shuttle did, um, it, it allows some of the more sensitive science to be preserved and bring it to a runway. And so we're really hyper-focused on the science, the science return, and we're, uh, we're specifically looking at right now is expanding that science capability so that we can, we can power more payloads, provide calm to more payloads, and bring more payloads back and forth, both, both for ISS and also for free flight missions in the future. Great. All right, last question um, for everybody on the panel, since we just have about a minute here. Uh, I want you guys to take out your crystal balls because when we are here in one year, uh, and hopefully I'll still be here if I haven't lost my job, Pat. Um, what is the one thing that you're going to be most excited about having accomplished in the next 365 days? Ben, I'll start with you. Let's see, from a, crew, uh, from a cargo perspective, just really um, um, making it seem, although it never truly will be routine, making it seem um, more routine and, and the continued success. I mean, really, it really takes um, eye on the ball, really takes a lot of attention to detail really takes a lot of dedication by a lot of uh, folks in order to make these missions come off so well. Uh, but uh, frankly, I'm, I'm looking at Kathy and her uh, team, and I'm really looking forward to having crew up there to make use of all this cargo that is being uh, supplied. Amen. I'll second that. I'm not supposed to, but yeah. <laughs> All right, Bob? I've, I've kind of described some incremental improvements that uh, we've been doing, and we have some of them coming up on the next few flights, so I'd like to see those be implemented and work just perfectly and add you know, more capabilities to our quiver, quiver of capabilities. Steve? Uh, a couple things. Well, uh, a year from now, we should be uh, majority of the way through assembly integration and test of our vehicle, so what I'm really counting on is that all those subsystems, when we've put them all together, they work like we expected them to work, um, and uh, hoping that we'll, we'll be uh, well on the way and, and uh, as few surprises as possible going through the next year, which uh, is just something you have to deal with when you go through uh, the first build of a brand new vehicle that's never been done before. So I hope to see that. I hope to see us uh, also involved in um, um, working, actively working the changes and the upgrades that we're going to make to the second tail member we'll be building. So that's, that's, that's what I'll be looking for. And Benji, last but not least? The flying crew, I, for sure. I mean, that'll be amazing, a truly amazing experience and an opportunity for all of us, all of us in the whole industry and for the world. Um, and then specifically to cargo, once we do that, we can start pivoting towards Dragon 2 for cargo. Excellent. For you? Oh, and for Blue Origin. Uh, well, I, I will add into the, uh, into the crude... Um, uh, discussion, yeah, we hope to be uh, uh, sending uh, Blue Origin employees, but also uh, astronauts up in the next year or so, but like you, only when, we're, only when we're ready. I think we all have a lot of work on our plates to do, um, but we, uh, in terms of opening up space for um, not just uh, the professionals, but, uh, but the world, I think collectively as an industry, we're doing a wonderful job, so continuing that going. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us for this panel. A round of applause. <laughs>